For this week's clinical file, we have Vic. Tor, Victor, I was going to say Victoria, <laughs> because that's our challenge with a title holder all the time. But Victor actually is treating a patient with a history of Parkinson's disease and bradykinesia. Upon examination, the patient has a gait speed of 0.45 meters per second and a diminished stride length bilaterally. Which of the following is the most recommended? to address the impairments. So we look down at our answers. We have A, floor markers, B, rhythmic auditory stimulation, C, toe wedge, and D is standard walker. All right, so let's go up to the top. For those of y'all on the podcast, y'all heard me say Victoria. In our private Facebook group, all right, our private Facebook group, we do these live every single week on Wednesdays. And Megan Victoria has been a freaking crusher of every single one of these questions. She's like killing it in the group. And so I mistakenly said Victoria when it was Victor. All right. So Victor is treating a patient with a history of Parkinson's disease and bradykinesia. Let's slow it up there for a second before we go on because I think it's important for us to kind of get a feel for what this pathology is like what are we really looking at all right so Parkinson's disease definitely one that you need to be ready for on the MPTE um, a lot of times these patients will present with uh, difficulty initiating motion a lot of times you'll see it known as akinesia if it's if we're talking about gait it's often known as like freezing of gait like where they stop they can't initiate that motion right and Parkinson's disease is known to have difficulty or dysfunction, I should say, of the basal ganglia and the parts of that. And so it's not, you know, crazy for me to see bradykinesia because these patients often have very slow motions, minimal motions. Um, and so again, we expect a lot of this with Parkinson's. Now it says upon examination, the patient has a gait speed of 0.45 meters per second and diminished stride length bilaterally. Again, two things that I would already expect in this patient population anyway, because patients with Parkinson's, they have bradykinesia, they move slower. And with gait, they often are slower as well. And so 0.45 meters per second is pretty god darn slow when you're talking about gait. Um, getting up close to one and above one is where you see more normal gait, um, but this is slow. All right, and so we have slow gait here. We also have diminished stride length bilaterally. And so we know that this patient, first of all, isn't taking long steps, but they're not taking long strides either. Okay, well, that's going to decrease our gait velocity, our gait speed, if they're not taking very wide strides, right? So all of this makes sense for a patient with Parkinson's. Now it says, which of the following is the most recommended to address the impairments? Now, before I go down into the answer choices and I review those again, I want you to think about what we just read. I want you to think about what this question is really asking you for. Set it up for me. Patient has Parkinson's. Patient has bradykinesia, slow gait. They're very slow. And then when it comes down to their stride length, we know that that's very limited or they have a small stride length. So the question's asking, you know, what intervention is going to be best to address the primary impairments that I'm seeing here? All right. The issue with the stride length, the issue with their gait speed. So for those of you on the podcast, let's go down to the answer choices and look at them. A says floor markers. B says rhythmic auditory stimulation. C says toe wedge. And D says standard walker. Let's go up to the top. Floor markers. What do you know about this? Floor markers, exactly what it sounds like. It could come in a bunch of different forms. It's a visual cue. It could be a tape strip down on the ground in multiple spots along the floor. Um, you could use cones. I mean, there's a bunch of different visual cues that we can use here. They even, hey, have you seen the U-Walker? The U-Walker can have like the laser that's projected on the floor. That could be a visual cue as well. My question for you is, what are floor markers used for? What's their primary purpose? And is it used for gait speed and diminished stride length? So here's the thing. 
Floor markers are used as a, an attentional uh, strategy. It's trying to get the patient's attention or prove the attention. Most of all, floor markers like claim to fame is helping with this thing called freezing of gait where the patient has difficulty initiating that step. They get stuck, they can't move. And it's like, you know, obviously they want to move and we as therapists, we're there with them. We want them to take a step, but they're just stuck. And one way that we can get them to break out of this freezing of gait is by using floor markers. Put them down on the floor, like I said, it could be a tape strip or whatnot. You can even drop a Kleenex. You can flip the cane over. There's a bunch of different ways that you can, you know, just flip this script a little bit to flip this situation and to kind of break that whole freeze mode that they go into. So what do we do with these floor markers? Well, we can ask the patient to step on the floor marker, step on the tape. We can ask them to step over it. You know, if it's tape on the floor or a cone or something like that, again, it kind of breaks that whole freezing of gait. It helps with attention and allows the patient to keep going. Now, will this improve the patient's gait speed? Eh, indirectly, because we'll continue to walk instead of freezing and having difficulty initiating. So yeah, but floor markers are really used to help with freezing of gait. Like that's their main claim to fame. All right, that's what they're really used for. All right, and so, Right now, I mean, A is not an awful answer, but possibly there's better. Let's continue down. B says rhythmic auditory stimulation. It's also known as RAS. All right. You may know this as the metronome, though. You know, the, the, the device is like tick, 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 back and forth, back and forth, right? It, it sets a beat or a cadence, if you will. All right, yeah, you can download it on your phone. If you don't have this on your iPhone or your Android, you can download the app and then use it with your patient. It's just like a beat that the patient's able to hear. Now, my question to you is, is that going to help with our gait speed? Is that going to help with our stride length? The answer to that is absolutely freaking lutely This is one of the amazing, one of the most effective strategies for improving cadence for improving gait speed and for improving a patient's stride length. Why? Because the patient is supposed to be stepping to the beat. Ah, stepping to the beat, right? And so if the patient's stepping to the beat, we can change how fast they step, all right? And so that allows us, again, to change the patient's gait speed, allows us to change the patient's, their stride length as well, all right? So I like rhythmic auditory stimulation as an answer choice i'll hold on to it for now i think it's much better than floor markers y'all let me know all right let's go down to c c says toe wedge okay so toe wedges are used in patients with uh parkinson's they are used the toe wedge is exactly what it sounds like it's a wedge that's placed up underneath the toes and what it really does is it shifts the center of mass backwards that's the reason why we use it we shift the center of mass backwards. And you may be like, well, why? Why do we do that? So if you can think of a patient right now, and if you don't know this, definitely go on Google, go into your, your one of your um, neurology textbooks or neuromuscular textbooks. And a lot of the times they have a picture of a patient with Parkinson's. They're kind of hunched over in the forward flex posturing, right? And when they ambulate, they ambulate with this thing called fascinating gait, right? It's like shuffling, right? Their feet are shuffling. So just have that image in your head right now of the patient, you know, in that forward head posturing and the rounded shoulder and the, and, and the thoracic kyphosis, and they're just rounded over, right? And they can't move their trunk very much. Well, think about this. Where do you think their center of mass is? If their whole body is kind of leaning forward, where is their center of mass? It's anterior. So here's the thing. These patients oftentimes have this fascinating gait because their anterior center of mass is what they're trying to catch up to. So it's like their center of mass is so far forward that it's kind of like they're falling forward. And so if we want to stop fascinating gait, if we want to slow it down or reduce it, what we can do is shift the center of mass backwards. Well, how do you do that, Coach K? You do that with a toe wedge. So bottom line, I, you know, I don't want to get too in depth here, 
right? Because it's out of the scope of this question. But I do want to say this, that toe wedges for patients with Parkinson's are really used for festinating gait. It's not used for freezing of gait. It's not used for gait speed or stride length. It's used for festinating gait. And so I'm going to put an X next to that because the question isn't asking you about how can we improve festinating gait? How can we improve shuffling gait? How can we improve the fact that the patient has an anterior center of mass? Like it doesn't say anything like that. Let's go down to D. D says the standard walker. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to eliminate this one pretty quickly. You want to know why? Because giving a patient with Parkinson's a standard walker in a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, not all, but in a lot, will actually increase freezing of gait. It will actually slow them down instead of speeding them up. Isn't that wild? So your standard walker, and you're talking about one that doesn't have wheels on it or anything like that, um, you know, just has the four pegs on on uh, on each side, right? Or or one peg on each side, and four of them, and it's just the basic standard walker. And so in this case, a lot of times you'll see it more freezing of gait, slower initiation, and slower gait speed. It's exact opposite of what I would want. Now, if it put down something like a U walker or something like that, yeah, that could potentially improve the gait speed, but still B, rhythmic auditory stimulation, I would say is our best freaking answer here. B, B is in boy, rhythmic auditory stimulation. If you got this question correct, congratulations. Uh, you know, as those of you who are preparing for the MPTE coming up, this is one of the areas I suggest you take a look at before you get to that MPTE. Parkinson's is a major area that's tested on. It's a big neuropathology. And then some of these interventions, you kind of skim over a little bit. Maybe you're in your review book, you kind of skate over it and you don't really understand why you would use a floor marker or why you would use rhythmic auditory stimulation. You may not even have gone into that word and figured out what the heck that was. These are the types of questions that can come up and leave you kind of like, ah, why do I use one over the other, right? So we got to dig deeper into that. And I'm telling you, your textbooks do a great job of outlining it. But I'm not going to leave you with that basic just definition and, and flow and strategy today. I want to take you to the next level. I created a cheat sheet that outlines floor markers and rhythmic auditory stimulation and even the U walker. I talk about it in there in order to give you something to review right before your MPTE so you're ready to freaking go. So for those of you on the podcast, whether you're on Apple, iTunes, Spotify, Ghana, whatever you're on right now, go into the show notes, click the link in there, and you can get it.